Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. My name is Bill Durr, and I'm an attorney with Warden Smith here in our Asheville office. Uh, just real quick about uh, our firm. We have five offices across the state. Uh, we cover uh, from the coast to the mountains. Uh, we've got offices in the eastern part of the state, also in Raleigh, and then obviously here in Asheville. I've got two of my law partners with me today. Um, Devin Williams. Devin is our labor and employment expert. Devin is from our Raleigh office. Uh, she's out here uh, because she loves the mountains today and also might sample some craft beer later on. Uh, Zach Lamb, uh, who is our trust and estates expert and also a business law expert, he's in our Asheville office as well. So Zach and I work together out here. Um, how many of you is this your first time at this seminar? Fantastic. That is excellent. Well, uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to go through a little bit of some of the things to be aware of and watch out for in, uh, in the legal world uh, as it relates to farming and a little bit of agritourism in there. If you have been with us uh, before, uh, we have a very different presentation this year. Uh, typically what we will do is try to take questions as we go through. This year we've got a lot of material to cover, so if you would hold your questions to the end. If we have time, great. If we don't and you have questions, we're going to be around all day. All right, so just grab us. We've got a table out over in the other hall, and then the, we've got the one-on-one -on -one sessions as well that we're happy to talk with you and answer questions. But we have an immense amount of material to cover. Um, we're also going to do a little bit different because we're going to be looking at uh, a little bit of a, a scenario, if you will. And we try to uh, change it up by looking back in time. Uh, and we're going to talk about Barry. All right? Barry's a farmer, uh, and we're going to cover some of the, uh, the legal issues that Barry uh, has encountered over the years. And hopefully uh, some of this will be able to translate into the problems or issues that you may encounter uh, or, more importantly, try to avoid. This is not legal advice. Uh, we do not have any attorney-client relationship with any of you, as best as I can tell. I don't see any familiar faces in the room. We would certainly welcome the opportunity in the future, should you decide to do that. We can talk about that later, but what we're going to talk about is not legal advice. All right, let's set the stage, all right? Barry is, as I said, a farmer. And Zach's going to start us off with a little discussion about uh, stage one, and that's the farm acquisition. Zach? All right, well, good morning. Uh, so unlike Bill and Devin, I, I, I'm a, an attorney who, I, if you see me in the courthouse, I'm lost, so come help me. Uh, I, I, I help people. Usually people come to choose to be with me. We talk about planning so you don't need a litigator or some help in court. Uh, so most of my day is spent talking with people about death, taxes, incapacity, you know, the fun stuff. So, of course, my presentation is going to start with somebody dying. Uh, so we're going to go back to how Barry acquired the farm. Uh, so if we go back in January 2005, um, his father, Grandpa, uh, passes away. And so Grandpa is survived by his wife, Grandma, by his two sons, Barry and Larry, and they had a, a sister, Mary, who's already passed away, but she left two kids, Harry and Terry. Uh, and I to, you might notice the names wrong. I, I, I probably deal with maybe 100 families or so a year, and I get to know a lot of family names, and this isn't uncommon. Um, my, my father was one of nine, and his parents had the bright idea of all J names. Um, I have an older brother, Josh, and thank, thank goodness my parents ultimately moved, named me Zach and broke that trend. <laughs> Uh, so that's the family. We've got two sons and then two grandchildren from a deceased daughter. And so the farm that Grandpa owned, that they all grew up in, <clears throat> Grandpa had inherited it. Uh, his parents had left it to him, uh, and he didn't do anything with it. So the, when he died, the farm was just in his name. Uh, and, and that's uncommon. That's <coughs> not uncommon. In, in North Carolina, real estate uh, passes pretty uniquely. There doesn't have to be a deed after somebody passes away. Uh, title just automatically vests in either the beneficiaries under the will or in, in the heirs if there is no will. Uh, 
Uh, so the tax bills still came to Grandpa's father's name. You know, he paid the tax and the county was happy, and so he just left it and moved on. So when Grand Grandpa died, he, he never got around to making a will. And, and so we're going to see what plays out uh, because he didn't have a will. So who gets the farm? So Grandpa's name, who survived uh, by his wife, and most people pretty much assume that their spouse is going to get you know, what their deceased spouse uh, had. And that's not the case. Uh, in this case, Grandma's not going to own the farm, or at least not 100% of it. Uh, it. There's a way to, a lot of, it, there are, there's a type of ownership that's special just among married couples, that if you own real estate and you're, you're married when you acquire the property, the title's in both of your name, and you'll usually see a husband, the name, and then and wife, and their name. Uh, if you're married when you acquired it, 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 you didn't tell your closing real estate attorney to do something different than the deed. It's treated as owned by, by the married couple together. It's like a joint ownership. It's not half and half. It's together they own the whole. And if, if you own it that way, then when one dies, it, it's automatically the survivors by operation of law. You don't need to do anything at the probate court's office. Uh, it's, it just passes automatically. So a lot of times that saves people. But in this case, where it was just in Grandpa's name, it doesn't save Grandma. And so Grandpa didn't have a last will. And so a common question I'll get from people is, well, does that mean it just all the sheets to the state? And the answer is no. Uh, we have, the, the, our, our legislators in Raleigh <coughs> have passed statutes that say who gets what when someone dies <coughs> uh, without a will. And, and they've, they've intended to do what they would expect people would want. Uh, it, 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 it rarely works perfectly for any situation, it kind of, but it doesn't work drastically wrong in any situation. Um, it's called an intestate succession, uh, and intestate's just a fancy Latin word. I never took Latin, but I had to learn a few of them because uh, the law likes them, but it means without a will. Testate's with a will, intestate is without a will. Uh, so uh, under the statutes, it lays out who gets what. And so grandma's included, because you'd think that if someone passed away, they'd want their spouse to get something. Uh, and there's different rules based on whether you have children and how many children you have, uh, as far as what the percentages are. But in this situation, grandma gets one third of the farm, and then the other two thirds gets divided up among the, the descendants. And that, that ends up being two nights to Barry and two nights to Larry. And then Mary's two nights get split between her two children, Harry and Terry. So, so let's let that sink in for a second. Grandma, who's you know, lived on this farm for the last several decades, now doesn't own the farm. At least she doesn't have complete ownership of the farm. She now owns it with her children and her grandchildren. Um, and so they own it as tenants in common, uh, which is another type of ownership for real estate. And there's certain attributes that follow with that kind of ownership. One is every owner gets has the right to use the property. So, and no owner can exclude others from using the property. So, Grandma, fortunately, in this situation, the family gets along, so they let Grandma live there and uh, don't kick her off or try to start renting it or moving in. Uh, but, but that's when families don't always get along, it can be problems. Uh, there's also other problems. There's some creditor risk there. So now they all have an interest in the farm. If Larry, Larry, Harry, or Terry have any kind of debt issues, that they cause a car accident. Uh, we heard the gentleman from uh, the Cherokee uh, band of Indians. They go out to the casino and run up a big credit card debt. If, if they, they have any kind of judgment against them, that creditor can then go after the farm. Because it, it basically, and the law allows any owner to sue for what's called a partition action, where they can try to divide the property and, and, and say, I want my little share. And if you can't divide the property, they could force a sale of the property. Uh, so, so rarely is this kind of joint ownership a good scenario for people. So then Grandpa had some other assets as well. He had a joint bank account with, with Grandma. And so joint bank accounts, almost, I've seen one in the 12 years that I've been doing uh, practicing law. 
where it doesn't have survivorship rights. Just about every account now, when you go and open it and you sign your bank account signature card, it, it, it says that when one of you dies, it's automatically going to be the survivors. It doesn't go through probate. It's very easy. Uh, so fortunately, that account all goes to grandma. She can get it the next day. There, there's no freezing of the account. Uh, they also owned a life insurance policy, and it's one of those second to die where it pays out after both grandma and grandpa passed. Uh, they bought it years ago, uh, has a $1 million death benefit, um, and, and nothing happens with that. It's, it's a contract between them and the insurance company. It, grandma and grandpa were listed as owners. When one dies, grandma just continues being the owner, has full control over it, can name the beneficiaries. Uh, so that, that, that actually moves pretty simply. Then they, they have their, their farm equipment and some personal property, household furnishings and effects. Uh, total about $100,000. Everything except titles at the DMV. No one really gets excited usually about personal property. Possession is, is ownership. Uh, and then there's the brokerage account. Uh, Grandpa actually, over the years, farm operations had gone pretty well, so he, he had invested in some stocks and had a brokerage account that he had set up just in his name and nothing else. And so, how did these assets get split? And it, it's not exactly the same as the real estate. It, the laws say that with personal property, and so this would be the, the farm equipment and the brokerage account, so that, that $300,000, grandma gets the first $60,000, and then she gets one third of what's left. And so the third of $240,000 is $80,000. Um, then Barry and Larry, each get two ninths of the 240, or the 53,000, and then Harry and Terry split Mary's share of that. Uh, so it's just to illustrate that by not having a will, assets are going not to grandma, they're going to the children, and maybe that's what grandpa wanted, maybe it's not, uh, but, but we won't move. And so this, this is minor complications, and, and there's a pun intended here. Uh, the grandchildren are all, they're both under 18. Uh, and so they're each receiving more than $5,000. Uh, if it's under $5,000, there's some simplified procedures we can use to get around it. But if it's over $5,000, you have to go this round. Uh, there has to be a court process. There's a court hearing. You have to go before the court, and the court will appoint a guardian of the minor. That guardian is going to have to be bonded. That, that means and you're either putting up money, you know, paying cash to the court, which is unusual, or you're going to an insurance company and paying them a premium annually. That, that basically says if the guardian disappears and steals the minor's money, the insurance company pays it to the minor to make them whole. But there's an expense associated with that. And then that guardian has to file an annual accounting with the clerk until the minor reaches age 18. And even with this family getting along, there's no way to get around that. There's no, you, the family can't waive these requirements. The court has no, no authority to waive it. This just has to happen. Uh, and, and to me, this is a waste, because uh, it's very easy to plan and get around this. Uh, but it, it, if, if there's minor beneficiaries involved and you don't have these kind of plans to avoid guardianship, it, it's going to be complicated, expensive. You're going to have people like Bill have to go and, uh, if, go to court and argue it for you. So estate tax. Um, so remember, I, I found this table. Uh, let's see if we can go so, so the estate tax has been with us. It was first passed in our country back in around the Civil War. That uh, was when it came into being. And, and we've had it. This table goes back to 1916 and, and kind of traces it. And I couldn't fit it all on one, so we broke it up. Uh, and so there's an exemption which basically, if you're under that, you can pass that amount at death, and there's no tax. If you're above that amount, you're going to be taxed on it. it historically, it used to be a progressive rate, just like income taxes. Uh, now, it's a flat rate, so it's basically, if you're above it, you pay a flat rate tax rate. Um, and so, we have the, the state tax exemption, and then it, you'll notice these first few years, there was no gift tax. So, if, you, if, if you're above $50,000 and you know that you're going to die and you know if you passed it to death that there was going to be a tax and there's no gift tax, naturally you say, well, okay, I'm going to give it to my children on the deathbed and you escape the estate tax. 
Congress finally figured that out and passed, a, you know, closed that loophole and passed the gift tax. So it's basically you have a kind of a unified exemption of what you can transfer either at life or at death. Um, so you can see it, it, it used to start at a very low number. And it, it, so the state tax touched a lot of people. It was a pretty big revenue generator you know, 80, 90 years ago uh, for our country. But you'll notice it starts creeping up. There are two instances where it actually goes down. Uh, you'll notice here in the 30s it goes from $100,000 down to $50,000, and then later in the 30s, 50 to 40. And, and, and I'm guessing no one here was alive in the 30s, but anyone? Yeah, yeah that's when the Great Depression was happening, so our, our country needed some, some revenue, and so that was a revenue raiser. But after that, the exemption has slowly crept up. <coughs> Uh, and you'll notice in the 70s, the tax rate, it was, in the, it was in the 70% all the way up to the early 80s. So if you were above the exemption amount, you, uh, over half of, of your estate would then go to the government for taxes. And, and so naturally, a lot of people weren't happy with that. Um, but then you'll notice, as we get to more modern times, really with the, 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 the Bush presidency is when they passed laws that it finally got above a million dollars, and it was kept creeping up. Uh, and, and then in 2009, it got to three and a half million dollars. In, in 2010, it disappeared. Uh, there was no estate tax in 2010. That was when George Steinbrenner passed away, the owner of Taco Bell passed away. Uh, but then they retroactively said, well, we'll reinstate it uh, at five million dollars. And so it kind of crept there, and it's indexed for inflation is why you see these numbers. Uh, this only goes to 2014, but it, it kept plugging along. And then in December of 2017, we got our new tax law. And so beginning in 2018, it's, it was $10 million of exemption indexed for inflation back to 2010. So it was $10,180,000. Uh, and so it's crept up. This year it's $10,580,000. Uh, so if you're under that, you don't have to worry about estate tax. So that's just kind of how we got here. And so now we're going to go back to Grandpa's estate. Uh, so back in 2005, there's the federal estate tax, and there, North Carolina has its own separate state estate tax. Uh, fortunately, they, they made it easier for us, and so the exemptions were the same. But that, back then, it was $1.5 million. Um, and so today, just to throw it out there, North Carolina no longer has its own state estate tax. Um, most states have abolished them, but not all. So if you own real estate in some other state, you might need to check it out. Um, and, and this year, the exemption is $11.58 million. But the way the congressional budget rules are, when they pass these tax laws, they have to pay for it in the future. So they always say it's friendly, but then we're going to say it's going to get really worse sometime in the future and make some future Congress have to deal with the political fallout of either increasing the budget deficit or raising taxes. And so in 2026, this $11 million exemption is set to cut back in half, so, but it'll still be $5 million. But if a new, who knows what elections will bring. Uh, there is the chance, there's lots of talk about trying to bring it back down to $3.5 million or even lower depending on how uh, progressive the Congress ends up being. So let's apply the 2005 tax law to grandpa's estate. Uh, so so the, the way the calculation works is you basically value everything that's there. There are some deductions for things. And then what's left, you apply the tax rate to. Uh, so the farm, we look at what's in his estate. We've got the farm. We've got that bank account. We've got the life insurance policy. That really, we're just valuing the cash value because it hasn't paid out yet. We've got his farm equipment and personal property, his brokerage account, and you add all those up, and it's $1,550,000. So it's above the $1.5 million exemption. But the way the estate tax works is you get a deduction for everything you leave to a surviving spouse. Uh, kind of the policy is Congress doesn't want to be viewed as you know, forcing a, a widow or a widower to, to sell the assets to have to pay tax. And they're comfortable if giving this exemption because they know they'll get their tax when both spouses have died. Um, and so what did grandma got? She got a third of the farm, she got the joint bank account, she got the life insurance policy and some of the personal property. 
So she her she got seven hundred and twenty three thousand dollars. So the taxable estate is the one point five minus the seven hundred. It's about eight hundred twenty seven thousand dollars. And because that is under the one point five million dollar exemption, fortunately there's no estate tax when Grandpa died. So, so then, not uncommon when when one spouse dies and they're advanced in years, the, the other doesn't last too long, kind of they, they've lost a lot of motivation. I sadly see this a lot. Um, so six, six, seven months later, grandma passes away. But fortunately, she saw the mess, she saw the guardianship proceeding for the grandchildren, she, she wanted to, to, to avoid all of that. And so she actually made a will after grandpa's death. And she left the farm to bury because he was the one who wanted to work it and was out there. And then she left everything else to, to all the descendants equally. So what did she have? She, she, owned, she didn't have anything else other than what she had received from Grandpa. She had the farm, the bank account portion that she received, the personal property, and the life insurance policy. But now the life insurance policy is paid out. So her total is $1.6 million. So how does her assets get divided? Uh, you know, the farm, we said, goes to Barry, and then everything else gets divided, a third of each to Barry and Larry, and a sixth each to Harry and Terry, the two grandchildren. So how do we do the calculation on her estate? It's 1.6 million. The exemption was 1.5. She's not married, so she doesn't get any kind of marital deduction. Um, so the chart, she actually has a taxable estate of $123,000. <clears> Back then, the tax rate's 47%. This year, it's 40%. Um, just let to stay there. So there's actually tax due of $57,000, and that's just for the privilege of passing assets on to the next generation. Um, and <clears throat> This was back in 2005. There's also some additional North Carolina estate tax too, and it's a more of a complex calculation, so we won't bother with that because we don't have to deal with it anymore. Um, so what happens to the farm? So right now, the farm is now owned five ninths by Barry, two ninths by Larry, and one ninth each by the grandchildren. So now they've got the same problem that Grandma had, except the family doesn't get along and without Grandma to, to sit there and set everybody straight. Uh, Barry, who's, who's been on the farm and is willing to take it over, he, he, he's willing to, but he doesn't want to deal with co-owners uh, if he's going to put his you know, sweat, tears, and time into it. So what, but he can't just force the, the, his brother to sell. He can't force the grandchildren to sell. Um, so there's, there's lots of negotiating back and forth. They have to pay for appraisals. You know, he, he's arguing one price. Larry's saying he wants a higher price. So it's, it's a battle back and forth. Uh, the brother, Larry, threatens to, that if he doesn't buy him out at Larry's demanded price, that he's going to go to court and divide up the farm, uh, which, which Barry just doesn't want, and ultimately ends up he's willing to pay a little more for it. And, and because of Harry and Terry are still minors, to, for them to sell their interest, the, the guardian has to go to court and have them approve the sale as being fair. Uh, so it, it, it's, it, it's a costly situation just to get the farm where it needs to be. But ultimately, they come to a deal. Barry goes to a bank, gets a loan on the, secured by the farm so he can just pay cash to everyone else and have full ownership and go his own way. And at that point, we, Barry now owns the farm. <coughs> so I think at this point, we will turn it over to Devin. Good morning. Uh, so moral of the story is have a will, do estate planning, um, it's one of those things that our uh, trust and estates attorneys always talk about how important it is uh, at any age, uh, no matter what assets you have, to uh, have a will in place so you can hopefully avoid some of the things that Zach uh, walked us through. Um, so now we're getting into a stage of the farm where Barry needs more help. Uh, he needs more hands to uh, operate and grow the farm, and he's trying to figure out his options for doing that. And so we're going to go through each of these. We're going to talk about whether he should hire volunteers or interns and what that looks like. We're going to talk about independent contractors, uh, farm labor contractors. This is a special breed that we'll talk about. It's different than an independent contractor. Uh, and then D, uh, directly hiring employees. 
so the first question that we get a lot of times is, especially for smaller operations that are trying to get off the ground running, is can't I have folks volunteer? Well, the general rule is that there's no such thing as a volunteer in private employment or private sector employment. Uh, so private for-profit companies, the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is the federal law that governs how you're supposed to pay employees, says you can't do this in private sector employment. However, you can have volunteers in civic, religious, charitable, nonprofit. You can also have them in public uh, sector employment, which is, uh, I think, unique that the federal government says, well, private employers you can't, pri public we can't. Um, but there are still some exceptions, even if perhaps Barry uh, tries to operate his farm or gets it um, uh, operating as a nonprofit. Even if that's the case, he still has some rules that he would have to follow. In order for a volunteer to truly be a volunteer, there has to be no expectation of compensation. And the volunteer is actually volunteering the time to help with the mission of whatever the civic, religious, nonprofit uh, organization's purpose is. Um, another example is even if Barry had employees and volunteers, let's say he did operate some kind of nonprofit organization, you can't have your employees uh, then volunteering to do the same work that they've done as an employee. Um, and so generally speaking with a farming operation that is you're not going to be able to utilize volunteers um, without a significant risk. The next question that we get is interns um, because a lot of folks uh, who maybe have operated a farm for a while have a lot of knowledge to offer to folks who are younger and desiring to learn um, and have a mentor develop that expertise. Um, and so yes, you can employ interns, uh, however, it has to satisfy this test called uh, the economic realities test or what we also deem the primary beneficiary test. And that's easier to remember because it's basically asking who is the primary beneficiary of the relationship between the intern and the organization. Um, and so that seven factor test is going to address such things as, is there an expectation of compensation? If there's an expectation of compensation, even if subtle, uh, that's going to lean in favor of it being employment, not an internship. Um, the second is, is it being provided in some type of educational context? And this is going to include some hands-on training, uh, perhaps even, uh, yeah, excuse me, hands-on training or clinical training. The third is that is it tied to formal education, the intern's formal education, which could be through academic credit um, or, you know, just through maybe they're taking a class and this complements that class, even if they don't ultimately get academic credit. Um, the fourth factor, uh, which is very similar to the third, is does it, how does it correspond with the academic calendar or the intern's uh, you know, coursework? Um, and so, for example, if you think about internship during the summer months when you're out of class, uh, that complements the academic calendar, or if you think about it as a fall semester, spring semester type of arrangement. Um, now, if, you, if someone's, someone's employed year round with you, that's probably gonna lean more towards not really complementing the academic calendar and looking more like an employment relationship. The fifth is that the internship is expected, the duration is expected to be limited. This isn't same thing, not a, a long uh, permanent type of relationship, but is intended to be limited to allow for that beneficial learning experience. The sixth factor is that uh, the intern's work complements rather than displaces other employees work. So you're not bringing in an intern to do the same thing that Sally's doing, um, and she's a permanent employee of the operation, that's going to look more like you're bringing the intern in as an employee. Um, and then the seventh factor is that uh, the intern and employer understand that the internship is conducted with it, without entitlement to a paid job at the conclusion of the internship. Now obviously there could be uh, the possibility, that's okay, that there's a possibility that if you know the relationship works out well uh, that that could ultimately lead into something more permanent down the road but again these these are all factors that are kind of on this balance um, beam and you have to or scale excuse me 
Um, and so if one factor is weighing heavily towards employment, it doesn't mean that if you have the other six that you have an employment relationship. So you just have to look at all uh, seven factors in there. Okay. So the next uh, question that we oftentimes get is independent contractors. Can I just have somebody come in as a contractor, not consider them an employee? Um, you know, I just pay them a flat rate. I uh, don't have to you know, worry about benefits, workers' comp, all of that. And that's a significant risk. Uh, more and more we are seeing, and we're seeing the federal government do this as well as state governments um, are kind of coming down on this classification of independent contractors. Uh, and you probably see in the news, uh, California in particular, talking about the gig economy um, and independent contractors for like Uber um, and DoorDash and companies like that. Uh, so that, you know, that's obviously very different than what we're talking about, but that movement of uh, kind of constraining the ability of organizations to use independent contractors is occurring across the nation. Um, and North Carolina does have a, um, uh, I guess, an agreement between agencies. It's not, it's not its own agency, but an agreement between some state agencies that also communicates with the United States Department of Labor uh, to try to, um, you know, find where misclassification is occurring and ha have the agencies talking to each other. So, some of the risk that can be presented by having misclassification of an independent contractor. And this is where, let me back up a little bit with a, with a contractor. So I'm not talking about um, a uh, landscaping company that is in the business for themselves, operating their own organization, and you hire that landscaping company to come to your personal residence, and you say, hey, I want you to make it look nice, use your tools, you know, just make my, make my yard look nice. That is more of an independent contractor relationship. That's not employment. You're not employing that person as an employee of your personal residence. Rather, what this is talking about is when you have a company, big, big company or big operation, but a company, and you're employing an individual and you're saying, hey, I want you to be um, a worker for me. I want you to be an independent contractor. Here's how we'll pay you. We'll sign an agreement to it. You want that too because you want a 1099. You don't want a W-2. I won't withhold your wages, that kind of thing. Um, that's what the governments all across the nation and the federal government are working to crack down on. Um, because ultimately in that relationship, the way that uh, a lot of folks view it, is the person that it potentially harms is that individual. Um, and it's not often, this is California's view, which is very different than North Carolina, but again, we're seeing this kind of come across the nation. Uh, California's view is that an individual contracting with a company is almost never going to actually be an independent contractor relationship. Um, so some of the risks that we have here, if you do misclassify, is uh, with workers' compensation. So you can have kind of two components here. You can have an uninsured issue, and this is where you did not buy workers' comp because you don't have an employee, you have a contractor. Uh, and the um, Industrial Commission of North Carolina uh, and the Attorney General comes after organizations who have failed to acquire workers' compensation insurance um, to cover their employees. And so the Industrial Commission and the Attorney General, there's, um, you know, there can be some significant fines and then potential, depending on how bad it is, potential for uh, prison time uh, based on the uninsured capacity. Um, the other piece of that is that carriers may, insurance carriers, may decide that, hey, we're, you told us you had no employees or you told us you had three employees uh, and really you have you know, 15 employees, you just had these other folks as contractors, you didn't pay for those contractors. Um, so our coverage is going to be limited to these employees, not these contractors. So then you're left on the hook for that potential risk of someone, a contractor getting hurt and you're having to pay for that out of your own pocket. Um, tax implications, this is where you're not withholding uh, payroll taxes, you're not paying the employer's portion of payroll taxes. Um, the IRS in, in the game of who always wins, the IRS always gets their money. Uh, Zach's diagram shows that with the estate tax. 
Um, so that can be a pretty significant uh, concern. There's penalties and fines in addition to the taxes that were not properly withheld. Um, and then there's wage and hour concerns. So you may have a, somebody who came to you and said, I want to be a contractor. I'll sign this agreement. This is what I want. And I hear so often folks say, yeah, that, that's what the person said they wanted. We've agreed to it. And now they're complaining that I haven't paid them the right way, but this is what we agreed to. Um, the way that these state agencies look at it, like the Department of Labor, um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't necessarily matter what the two of you intended by that contract. It's more what the actual relationship was. And so the wage and hour issue comes into play where someone is saying, you know, you didn't pay me overtime. I worked uh, 70 hours each week and you only gave me a flat fee. And so then you're having to go back over pro maybe to a two year time period and pay back wages to that person. Um, so as far as the factors to consider, uh, th and these are not all of them, but these are some of the main ones. If the person is in the business for themselves, again, think the landscaping company. If they're in the business for themselves, they're using their own tools and equipment, they're coming to you with the expertise, you're not giving them the expertise, you're not giving them training, you're not telling them how to do the job, and you're not exerting control or you don't really have the ability to exert control other than saying, hey, I want you to make this look nice. Use your expertise to make this look nice. Use your tools to make this look nice. Um, then you're gonna have a better shot of that entity uh, or potentially that person being an independent contractor. If you don't have those things um, and you're providing the tools, you're providing the training, you're telling them what hours of the day to come in and be there for you and you're supervising them closely, that's going to look more like your employee. Okay, so the farm labor contractor is um, unique to agricultural, um, to agricultural labor and to farming operations in general. And so the Migrant uh, and Seasonal Agricultural Worker Protection Act is going, is where this entity comes from. Um, so a farm labor contractor, what it does is it can be a person or entity, but that person or entity has registered with the U.S. <coughs> Department of Labor uh, to solicit, hire, recruit, transport, um, uh, provide residence for uh, migrant and or seasonal agricultural workers who are going to come in and do agricultural work for you. Um, and then that farm labor contractor contracts with a farm operation in North Carolina and says, hey, I can help supply X number of migrant workers or seasonal workers, and they're different. Migrant workers are those that uh, for the duration of their employment, they it's, the distance traveled does not allow for them to return to their permanent residence. Um, the seasonal agricultural workers are those, they can actually go home to their normal residence or their permanent residents, um, but they still are of a seasonal nature and you're still contracting with them through a farm labor contractor. Uh, there are some great benefits to working with a farm labor contractor, especially if you have a seasonal um, need and it, it, is, it is a large need. Um, the farm labor contractor can supply you those workers. They handle most of the heavy lifting in terms of bringing those folks on. However, the risk or the concern can be joint employment. Um, so when you have those folks coming on to your uh, land uh, to work, you more than likely or one of your other uh, employees is going to be supervising, instructing those folks what they need to be doing. Um, and so you are exerting some level of control over them. You do have some, some responsibility to ensure, what we'll talk about next, of all the things that you need to be doing with an employee, that those things are occurring. And um, you'll probably have a contract between the farm labor contractor and the farm um, that addresses a lot of this, but it's just something to keep in mind that, you know, you're not completely off the hook uh, in that situation. Um, it's not something you want to get into yourself, more than likely. If you have a farm and you're operating a farm, you don't want to then also try to become a farm labor contractor. Utilize reputable farm labor contractors to help you with that. Okay, so the last one, and you've probably gathered uh, which way I'm leaning us towards, 
um, is directly hiring employees. Now, a lot of uh, new operations that are getting started, um, whether that's farm, whatever industry you're in, you're sometimes hesitant to embark on employing folks. Um, and maybe even embark on employing folks that aren't in your close-knit circle. Um, and there are a lot of requirements for it, um, but if you do these along the way, you, this can be a great option for you. Um, so a couple of the things that right out of the gate that you need to make sure you're doing is I-9 and E-Verify compliance. So I-9 is uh, the form that you have your uh, employees fill out um, I encourage you to have them fill it out on their first day of employment. Uh, they're going to have to provide you required documentation. There's the form provides a list of uh, what documents you will need. And you look at those and you look at the person. You do it in person. Um, and as long as everything looks accurate, then you're good. Have the person fill it out on the first day. And you file that away. You hold on to it. But you don't really have to worry about it again. Uh, the second component of that is if you are large enough um, or if you are a federal contractor, so perhaps you are, uh, you've got a contract with the federal government to supply, um, you know, wheat or some other uh, crop to the government, then you may have to comply with E-Verify. So E-Verify is kind of the uh, fancy computerized electronic version of E-9 that it actually gives you uh, a response back on the person's documentation as to whether they are authorized to work in the U.S. Um, in, if you're a federal contractor, you have to do that. If you're not a federal contractor, in North Carolina, if you have more than, tw or if you have 25 or more employees, you have to use E-Verify. If you're less than that, you do not have to use E-Verify. You can, but you don't have to. Um, the other thing to keep in mind with that, the way that North Carolina's law defines employees for this specific purpose, for E-Verify, is if you employ 25 or more employees who are working for you for nine months or more. If you have only seasonal workforce and they work for you for six months, then you're not going to meet that 25 employee threshold. So you're not going to have to comply with E-Verify. Um, but uh, the other thing to keep in mind, if you do, if you are subject to E-Verify, or if you choose to do it, if you choose to do it, you have to do it consistently, and it has to occur after the person has started. So in conjunction with the I-9. You cannot use E-Verify because it gives you an automatic response. You cannot use E-Verify to screen applicants. Um, and there is a whole process if you get, you can get some wonky responses back if you do. Uh, there is a whole process for, for how to do that. So if anybody is subject to that and you have questions, like Bill said earlier, we'll be around. Um, but that's definitely something that uh, can be tricky, but there is some information that can help you with that. Um, the other uh, component of uh, compliance that is very important is wage and hour. So we've got the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is federal law, and we've got the North Carolina Wage and Hour Act, which is North Carolina's law that complements and supplements the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, you probably know, uh, general rule is that if you work 40 hours or more in a week, you must receive time and a half. Uh, you must receive minimum wage, which is 725. North Carolina hasn't changed that uh, from the federal standard. Um, the good news for agricultural uh, operations is that there are exceptions specific to your organizations. Um, the, the three main exceptions are uh, the exception from overtime pay. And this is going to be for uh, employers of agricultural workers are exempt from overtime pay. Now, this is not going to apply if the farm, if the work performed on a farm is not incidental to or in conjunction with the farming's operation. Um, so you've got to you've got to kind of think about it with blinders of folks who are actually doing agricultural work not other kind of subset of, of what might need to be done on the farm to keep it operating. Um, and it also will not apply if you have uh, employees who are going to your buddy's farm for the day to supply. That overtime exemption does not carry over to another farm. Um, it has to be your the employer's farm. Um, the second main uh, exception is from minimum wage. 
And uh, this is, it's kind of a, a tricky rule, but it's um, if you do not use more than 500 man hours, or man days, excuse me, of agricultural labor in any calendar quarter, then you do not have to pay minimum wage. So a man day is, is one employee working on your farm uh, during the day for at least one hour, that's gonna be one man day, and it's in a quarter. So you can have a variation of how many employees you have, but if you are under that threshold in the quarter, then you don't have to provide minimum wage. Again, that's probably something where we, you know, we'd want to sit down and kind of go through the numbers and make sure you're clearly under that. Uh, and then the third is my favorite, uh, immediate family members. Put them to work, you don't have to pay minimum wage. All right? So with that said, and I'm probably giving it away, uh, who, who here thinks that we should go the route, well, I guess yell out where you think we should go, where Barry should go. What would you recommend to Barry? Direct employee. Direct employees. I like it. All right. You've learned well. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So uh, we're going to continue on with these early years. Uh, things are going really well. And Barry decides to invest in a few pieces of new farm equipment. Having grown up on a farm, there's nothing like a new piece of farm equipment. I mean, there's just something that's special about that. So uh, he heard about an, a new no-till drill and a compost spreader that was being offered by a farm implement manufacturer. He makes a visit to the manufacturing plant in Illinois. Who can tell me what's wrong with that picture? Who? Green. <laughs> Who wrong, said it? wrong color. Okay. Very yeah. good. Very good. Excellent. Um, all right. So he heads out there, and wow, he just goes all in. I mean, this is ready to buy two pieces of equipment. He's out in Illinois at the plant. He signs a contract for both pieces of equipment. It's a new relationship. The manufacturer says, you know what, Barry? You look like a really nice person, but we require prepayment for these pieces of equipment. And he hesitates. It's a huge financial commitment for the farm. Plant manager is a really nice person, and he decides to take an advance off of the farm credit line, leaves a large check with the manufacturer. Manufacturer committed to a mid-February delivery. Sort of important, right? Have that, no that brand new no-till drill out there uh, for your spring planting. So, what happens? Late January, Barry does the right thing. Absolutely, he's on top of it. He reaches out to the manufacturer, says, hey, just checking in, everything good to go, everything's fine, don't worry about it, Barry. We are scheduled for a delivery during the second week of February. Perfect, everything is absolutely in place. Or maybe not. So on the 17th of February, he gets an email from the plant telling him due to a design defect recently discovered in both lines of equipment, Recent world events causing delays. They do not expect delivery will occur until late fall. Okay, that's a problem. Curiously, there is no mention of a refund. So Barry's crushed because you know what? Barry turned some income. He sold the old farm equipment that he was expecting to replace with the new no-till drill to help pay that credit line because when he took the credit line advance, that starts the next month, right? Right. So he has to, uh, he had sold the used equipment, he's worried about the money uh, that he deposited, he decides to shift gears, goes to use another manufacturer, he calls the plant and asks for a refund. Plant manager points him to the contract terms, politely says they do not intend to refund the money. Right. There's a provision in the contract that says, time is not of the essence, we're going to deliver this equipment whenever we can, buried in the so-called small print. I'm a litigator. I live in the world of small print every day. <laughs> All right? So, what does Barry do? He calls his attorney. <clears throat> Here are some of the issues. Venue. Venue is, all right, I've got a problem. I'm going to file a lawsuit. I'm going to file it right here in Buncombe County. Maybe you're not, because the contract terms often dictate where that venue is going to be. Where is the lawsuit going to be filed? Do you really believe that an Illinois manufacturer all right, is going to allow someone in Buncombe County to just go ahead and file a lawsuit willy-nilly out here in Buncombe County? 
contract probably says you got a problem and needs to be filed in Illinois. Bonus points for the person that knows the town in which it might be filed in Illinois. Moline. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. All right. Arbitration versus litigation. All right. Contracts, it is not uncommon to have an arbitration provision in these contracts. So Barry might be sucked up into an arbitration world versus filing a lawsuit. Mediation is a prerequisite to filing a lawsuit or a demand for arbitration. Also not uncommon that you're going to see a provision in there that says, hey, if you have a dispute with us, you have to make a demand for mediation. We have to participate in mediation before either one of us can file it for arbitration or uh, filing a lawsuit. Going back to the arbitration concept for a minute, folks often think that arbitration is the way to go. Uh, they believe that it's faster, it's cheaper, uh, and that you're going to get a decision more quickly than you will in the court systems. That may or may not be true. I think it's actually less true today than it was probably 10 or 15 years ago. So just be mindful of that. Um, cost. Right? How much is this going to cost Barry to, to fight this battle uh, with this manufacturer? And then the likelihood of success. All right? Um, if you ever meet with an attorney and that attorney guarantees you absolutely don't worry about it, you're going to win, right? walk out the door. Right? I don't make those guarantees ever. Right? The reality is, is if you end up in litigation, at least here in Buncombe County, and it's a jury trial, you're going to stand in front of 12 jurors. All right? They are supposed to be your peers. They may or may not be your peers. So you're going to have 12 people deciding your fate uh, on, on a lawsuit. So, those are some of the issues. And the moral of the story. To bring it back to really what you need to take away from this part of the talk, right? Every contract you sign, please read it, understand it. If you don't understand it, there is nothing wrong with saying, hey, I'm not really sure I understand all of this. I'm going to take this and, and, and look at it and give it some more thought and then come back to that person, all right? Um, every contract, you have to be aware of terms that are outside sort of those usual and customary terms, right? If you buy equipment here locally, you're going to know what those terms are. You're going to know, I mean, first of all, what was the red flag, right? Prepayment up front, right? For a for hundred percent? Oh, come on, all right? But you have to be aware of those, all right? And, and I, I gave the example because it's, it's really sort of a, a, a little bit of a ridiculous example, but the, again, the point is, is you have to understand those terms. If you don't, all right, that's also what we're here for. A good part of my day is, even though I'm a litigator and I love being in court and I love lawsuits, that's what gets me excited, all right? A good part of my day is spent of helping clients avoid litigation, right? On the front end, right? Looking in the contract and saying, you know what, Bill? I don't understand what this means. Tell me what this means. Should I be signing this? And if not, how should I change it, right? How should I ask the other side to change it? So that's, um, that's always important. Read the contracts. Don't sign anything that you do not understand. All right, so thanks to your great advice earlier, uh, to Barry, he has now amassed quite a farming operation and quite the workforce. Um, so he has 25 full-time year-round employees and approximately 20 seasonal <coughs> part-time employees. Um, he has uh, contracted with one farm labor contractor uh, so that throughout the year, depending on the season, he can have an additional 25 to 50 migrant and or seasonal workers. Uh, he has three independent contractors who provide actual expertise in certain specialty arenas. And during the summer, Barry now offers an internship program for approximately four college students enrolled in an agricultural undergraduate program. So let's take a look at what uh, tricky personnel issues could arise with these facts. All right, so Joe, uh, one of the uh, seasonal part-time employees, is injured while trying to unjam a conveyor belt. 
Luckily, the conveyor belt has an automatic shutdown that triggers whenever it senses a malfunction, and so it stopped. Clyde, one of the uh, true independent contractors, sees Joe, and he runs over to go help him. While trying to assist Joe, though, Clyde ends up exacerbating a prior back injury and is down for the count. One of the college interns, Sammy, hears all the commotion and thinks Joe and Clyde are just messing around and trying to play a prank on Sammy as usual. Sammy, not wanting Joe and Clyde to get the best of him this time, decides to play his own prank on Joe and Clyde by flipping the breaker switch to reactivate the conveyor belt. As a result of Sammy's prank, Joe ends up losing his right hand. Upon realizing that Joe and Clyde were not joking, Sammy runs over to help and ends up hurting himself in the process too. Um, so yes, a little, little morbid. Uh, this is how sometimes our minds go. We think worst case scenario. Um, so we have a part-time employee, but we have an employee, we have an independent contractor, and we have an intern, all who have been injured. In this, this situation is uh, about workers' comp, obviously. Um, best case is that Barry has a complete uh, or a comprehensive workers' compensation <coughs> policy that he has talked to the carrier and been clear that it covers his employees. It can cover your independent contractors, even those that are truly independent contractors, um, and interns. Worst case is in the hustle and bustle of uh, starting up his farming operations, he neglected to even get a workers' compensation policy at all. Um, and if, if we're talking about best case scenario, we're still talking about litigation, we're still talking about, you know, messy in getting hurt, uh, we're still talking about probably some disciplinary action that needs to happen with the intern, um, maybe some training or some OSHA issues that arise out of this because of the conveyor belt and the breaker switch and all of that. Uh, worst case, we're talking about, we go back to the slides from earlier, we're talking about he's uninsured, so the Industrial Commission and the Attorney General are coming in to assess fines and penalties and possibly uh, asserting criminal action against him, which could result in jail time. Hopefully that doesn't happen for Barry. Uh, two, uh, these folks are all injured. They need compensation. They need medical bills paid. If he doesn't have insurance to cover that, they're still coming after Barry for that. Um, and in the Industrial Commission, with the Industrial Commission, which uh, oversees work, the Workers' Compensation Act, Barry, the employer, is on the hook for their injuries. The requirement to have insurance is just there to hopefully help folks to avoid these catastrophic uh, payments. Um, so that's worst case scenario where we go back to kind of what Zach was talking about of division of assets and Gary's having to sell things to pay medical bills, having to uh, sell assets, parts of the farm to pay legal fees, all of that. Okay. So let's talk about some other things that could come into play here that makes this even trickier. Um, if Barry did not follow through on the I-9 and E-Verify compliance, he may, he may have actually employed a part-time seasonal worker who was not authorized to work in the United States. Who here thinks that if, uh, if this happened, that Joe's not authorized to work in the United States, who thinks that he is covered by the Workers' Comp Act or not covered by the Workers' So covered by the Workers' Comp Act. Who thinks he's covered? Okay. Who thinks he's not covered? And then who, who has to pay if he's not covered? Barry. Barry. Actually, <coughs> you right here, you're right. He's covered. Uh, had a case uh, uh, several years ago where um, because of a, a mishap, a true innocently done mishap, uh, an employee who was not authorized to work in the United States got injured pretty severely and we uncovered that in the process uh, that he was not authorized to work in the United States. Did not matter to the Industrial Commission. As far as the Industrial Commission was viewing it, their sole process is to look at was he an employee? Yes. Was he injured? Yes. In the line of work? Yes. You're on the hook. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind that we now have an employee who is not authorized to work in the United States, which opens up its own issues. And then <coughs> two, workers comp wives, you're still on the hook for that. Um, B, a misclassification. If Clyde was not actually a, a true independent contractor, 
um, and we misclassified him. And let's say that uh, Barry neglected to tell the workers' comp carrier that he employed Clyde as a contractor or that, you know, failed to um, include him in there. Uh, and Barry said, you know, to save a little bit of money on his premiums, he's only reported those that are actually his employees, the 45 total. Uh, the carrier is likely to come back and say, that's not covered. That person, that employee, that worker is not covered. Um, you know, you didn't pay for that under the plan. There's all these exclusions. Another reason why, even if you don't read the policy itself, have, have an attorney who is knowledgeable about insurance plans read that policy and make sure it's covering what you need it to cover. And if it's not, communicate about that. Uh, develop a plan with your attorney about how you're going to work with the carrier to make sure you get everybody covered. Uh, the last kind of tricky situation that uh, I thought might be interesting is, so we've got Sammy, a college student, uh, still probably not fully matured based on how he recklessly acted with the conveyor belt. But he's embarrassed and he tells his parents his version of the story, which uh, in our world we always have two versions of the story. There's our client's version and then there's the other side's version. And the truth is somewhere in the middle. But Sammy tells his parents his version and uh, Sammy's parents call their family attorney who is, uh, you know, all about uh, get it after Barry for this and sends a nasty demand letter to Barry insisting that Barry pay for Sammy's medical bills associated with the injury and the malfunctioning conveyor belt that allowed it to be reactivated with the flip of a switch. This situation, so Sammy likely as an intern, um, depending again on the insurance policy and the industrial commission, is probably still going to fall under uh, the Workers' Comp Act. But the interesting thing here the little nuance that we've added is the malfunctioning, saying that a malfunctioning conveyor belt caused the accident or that a malfunctioning you know, uh, breaker switch caused part of the accident and that it wasn't solely Sammy's fault um, raises a third party claim. So Sammy potentially is saying he and or these other folks who were injured may have a claim against someone other than Barry, like the conveyor belt manufacturer. And that is not subject to the workers' comp act. And so they could go after the conveyor belt manufacturer. And it could be uh, that Barry had you know, a buddy help him install that. And so we're talking about not this big conglomerate being sued, that Barry doesn't really care what happens to him. It might be a, a family friend or a buddy or you know, a, you know, whoever it might be. But it might be somebody that's also close to Barry that it implicates Barry and it causes more headache. Um, so all of those situations lead us to our moral of this story, which is compliance along the way is so important in ensuring that mishaps do not turn into catastrophic accidents. Um, you know, with the, with the I-9, if we had that in place, we would have been back to best case scenario, he has workers' comp there. Um, training. You know, making sure that folks understand, hey, we understand, you know, we know we're friends, we want to have a good time at work, but at the same time, we can't be doing these types of things. Uh, we can't be playing pranks on each other that could result in actions like this. Um, and communicating with the insurance carrier, making sure that you have the coverage that you need um, and that what you think you're paying for, you actually are paying for that. Um, that would have helped to ensure that we were operating under best case scenario um, and maybe even we were operating under best case scenario without Sammy getting involved. And so we're just talking about a, you know, a back injury, somebody throwing their back out and someone getting a little cut up. <coughs> so. All right, well, we're going to continue on with some... Uh some challenges that a farm and Barry face along the way, and we're still in our maturity phase. And Barry, again, doing great. He decides, you know what? We're gonna expand into private farm events and offer regular agritourism events. How many people in the room fit into this category? Agritourism, farm, private events. Okay, good, good number. So during a recent uh, farm dinner, group of visitors from Atlanta, 
arrive via a small bus. It's clear some of the guests visited some of uh, our local alcohol beverage establishments before heading to the farm. And during the farm tour portion of the evening, two of the guests ignore the no swimming signs and head down to the pond. While descending the bank to the pond, one of the guests steps in an old fence post, twists his ankle. While limping badly, he refuses any medical treatment. The evening ends without further incident. Great, super. He thinks nothing of the twisted ankle until two and a half years later. He receives a summons and complaint from the local sheriff's deputy. The complaint refer references that night 30 months ago when the guest twisted his ankle. Those are real life events. You have three years in which to file a personal injury action in the state of, New York, or state of North Carolina from the date of the injury. Three years. So he's well within that time. So let's look at some of the issues that we have. All right, he gets the summons and complaint from the deputy. I mean, ignore it. That happened two and a half years ago. All he did was twist his ankle. He said he was fine. He, he refused medical treats, right? He went off and had a great time. In fact, I saw him dancing out on the, on the dance floor that night, all right? Ignore it. Nothing's gonna come of it. It was all his fault. No, don't do that. Please, please don't do that. Um, as a litigator, all right, that's some of the worst uh, situations that we can find ourselves in. Because what's going to happen is if you ignore it, there will be a default judgment entered against you, right? And then you're going to get a notice of default, and sometime thereafter, you might have a sheriff's deputy spent, uh, pay, paying you another visit to start levying and executing on some of your farm equipment, all right? So please do not ignore it. What should you do? Well, report it to your insurance carrier, right? Barry's operating a big operation. We just heard from Devin, he's got a bunch of employees, he's got workers' comp insurance, hopefully, right? He's now into the private farm events and farm tours, a bunch of agritourism. He clearly has the necessary insurance that's available to him through a variety of sources to insure for these types of risks. So, he has his insurance, make sure you report it to your carrier. When you do, please, if you pick up the phone to talk to your agent, or if you drive down the road to talk to your agent, please turn around and then put it in writing to your agent, all right? Do not do it just verbally. Put it in writing. Send them via email a copy of the summons and complaint. I'm putting you on notice, all right? Well, <clears throat> that is, in most situations, going to get some coverage for Barry, right? Now, you got some challenges there, though, right? There are some policies out there that are based on a, you have to provide notice at the time of the occurrence. So if there's an event that occurs that's likely to trigger coverage, right, you have a duty to put your carrier on notice at that time. So I don't care, right, if it is a, a cut, all right, a twisted ankle, whatever it is. Right? It is not going to impact your coverage ability and whether or not you're going to get coverage and at what cost if you simply send a, a, a note to your agent saying, hey, this happened the other night on the farm. I don't think it's any issue, but I wanted to make sure that I put you on notice. Right? That's it. Someone might give you a call. They might do a little bit of investigation. Um, the other piece that, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but Barry could have done some other things at the time of the incident as well. All right, hold on a minute. All right, Barry got really busy. He got really busy. He forgot to tell his agent that the farm expanded to offer farm tours and farm dinners. That's a problem, right? That's a problem because Barry now has put himself in a position, right? of the carrier being able to issue what is called a denial of coverage letter. The insurance carrier, and I'm not faulting them, all right, they insure for certain risks, okay? So if you have a farming operation, they have a metric, and honestly, it is literally math, all right? This is all about risk, all right? It's literally math. They have a metric that says, okay, 
for these types of coverages, it's going to cost this much, right? Well, if you start a farm dinner and agritourism event, all of a sudden you have increased the potential for risk. You've got more people out on the farm. It's kind of like, all right, if you decide you decide you want to put a zip line in, all right? Great, put a zip line in, okay? But tell your insurance agent that you are putting in a zip line. Because if you don't, there will be, I can guarantee it, a denial of coverage. So, because he forgot to tell his insurance agent that the farm expanded to offer farm tours, farm dinners, Barry's going to get about a three-page, four-page letter, all quoting policy language, saying we're not going to give you any coverage. And, oh, by the way, we're not even going to give you a defense, right, to pay for a lawyer to defend this lawsuit because of you didn't tell us that you're doing this extra activities. Now what? All right? Well, first of all, Barry's going to have to pay for a defense. <clears throat> and despite all of the uh, best efforts, all right, good litigators don't come cheap. All right? So it's going to be expensive, and it's going to impact the farm operations. What could he have done better? Let's start at the very beginning, the night of the incident, right? If you are involved in agritourism activities, if you have private events out at your farm, right, you should have right, an incident report, okay? Now, there is a disagreement about this, and I acknowledge that there are some folks that will say, the less that's on paper, the better, right? I'm gonna let you make that decision, I will tell you that if I am defending an agribusiness right, in that situation and I have a well-prepared incident report, I will love that. All right? That's going to be helpful to me. If I have a shoddily prepared incident report that was done three weeks after the incident happened all right, uh, in the owner's hand, eh, probably not going to be very helpful for us and probably more harm than good. So, if you're going to use the incident reports, make sure they're filled out at the time of the incident. Make sure that you have uh, kept that documentation. How long do you have to keep it? Three years. Three years. At least three years, right? At least three years. We get into all complicated things. If the person that twisted his ankle was mm -hmm. under the age of 18, it actually may be longer than three years. But anyway, it's, it's just keep it for at least three years. Um, what could he have done better? We didn't talk about it, but let's assume this fact, right? They all roll up to the, uh, to the barn, bus, they pile out, everybody's having a good time, they look around, oh, this is great. They start right onto the farm tour, and nothing, you know, nothing indicating about an agritourism event or anything like that. What's missing from the side of the barn? The sign. Ah, yes, perfect, all right? The sign, all right? 99E, North Carolina General Statutes 99E, they've got an agro uh, uh, tourism sign. Make sure it's the right one, all right? So if you've had equine activities on the farm before and you shift gears and start doing agritourism, don't think that the equine activity <laughs> language is going to get you what you need. You have to have the specific sign for the agritourism, all right? So, it's a special, and it was just, um, I say recently, I've done this seminar for many years and it was done a long while ago. Uh, so make sure you have the signs. Be careful. I actually um, went online. You can get them. I still think you can get them from the Ag Department uh, through well, the state. Gives them up free. The Ag Department does have them. They were yeah. giving them away at the Amateurs and Networking Association meeting just a week ago. There you go. Here in Ashley. Yeah. So, but be careful, all right, because I actually went online and I, I, I had nothing better to do yesterday afternoon, all right? I was looking online and uh, believe it or not, on, on uh, Amazon, all right, they have the signs. I don't think they're compliant with the statute because the statute requires a certain size uh, lettering and things. So, if you're going that route, uh, be careful. I'm not sure that they're compliant. You're better off getting it right from the state. Make sure it is prominently posted. Right. Make sure that if you're hosting events in the evening and people are rolling up at night, 
that the sign is illuminated. All right? Having a sign right, in a dark corner doesn't do us much good. Um, what I also say is make sure you regularly take pictures of it. Just add, I mean, it's evidence that it was up, right? Because guess what, right? Injured, injured dude with a bad angle, I never saw a sign. It wasn't up. I never saw where it was. Yeah. Oh, I got four of my buddies that are going to say the same thing. Never saw a sign. Well, here's a picture. It was taken a week before. This is where it was. It's always been there, right? So make sure you take some pictures from time to time. Um, the, uh, the incident uh, report, we talked about it. Make sure that you at least put the carrier on notice. Um, have some signage around the pond, right? There was the no swimming sign, which is good, okay? Uh, maybe making sure that you've got a few more signs around, because here's what the deal is. If you, if you have a, um, an injury and that person is at fault, right? North Carolina recognizes a contributory negligence state. So if that person is even 1% at fault, it might be a contributory negligence claim. It keeps you totally out of any liability at all. Uh, the signs, 99E, they do not keep you from being sued. Just remember that, right? You can always be sued, right? It costs about $250 filing for you to go ahead and file a lawsuit down at the court clerk's office. Anybody can get sued. So just be mindful of that. All right. Last but not least, Zach, and I think we've got about 15 minutes if I'm doing my math correctly. All right, so uh, yeah, we're gonna end this. So we're in the maturity stage and Barry is now starting to, to do a little more uh, planning on how he has his farm operation. Uh, all the things that you've heard Devin and Bill talk about as far as compliance issues to, to try to keep you out of a lawsuit, you know, th those, those should be the first line of defense. Uh, but what we're going to talk about next is kind of the, I think of it as, you know, boxing off risk or kind of like firewalls of where, you, where you're cutting the fire line so at least you're limiting I think, the exposure of all your assets to different things. Uh, and, and a very common structure that, that farmers use is kind of a two business entity approach where you segregate your real estate, which is usually a very valuable asset. Um, often maybe the most valuable asset you have from the actual farm operations itself. Uh, and, and the most common structure we see is a corporation for your actual farm operations and then a separate LLC that holds title to the farm. Uh, and, and so doing it this way, <coughs> most of the time uh, for farmers, the risk is in the farm operations. So this would be where if your employees are all going to be employees of the corporation. Uh, contracts that you sign are going to be in the name of the corporation. Uh, you're going to be selling your, your produce, your product uh, to people. They're going to be paying the corporation. Uh, and then the corporation is going to be renting land from your LLC and paying rent. It'll have a separate bank account. Uh, and and it, if, if you do that all correctly and you know, kind of follow the rules and respect the formalities of the two different business entities, if there ever is some kind of claim, whether it's an employment claim, uh, it, w whether it's some agritourism person you know, slip at a, a tour, and, and there is a judgment despite your best efforts by a litigator, uh, they can only go after assets that are in the corporation. They can't go after your personal assets, they can't go after the farm itself that's owned by the other LLC. Uh, doing it that way, all, it, there's some tax planning benefits, usually income tax planning benefits by doing it that way. Uh, that's a, we could spend hours on that, but it, you, if you have a good accountant, they can help you uh, plan. Uh, I think good accountants, they pay for themselves. It's not just tax reporting. If you talk to them on the front end, they can guide you on how you can deduct things and pay less tax when you file your returns. Uh, and, and asset protection planning, again, this is kind of the last line of defense. It, insurance is always important. I, I, would, I would say get insurance before you spend the money to form these entities. Uh, so come that, that's the, the basic structure. So if you do a lot of different things at your farm, some, some farmers will, will have separate entities. So you might have you know, one corporation for this line of business, uh, maybe a separate corporation for the actual you know, agritourism. 
uh, if you're doing distributing, you might have a separate corporation to do the distributing. Yeah. If, if you're looking at it, it it's a, you're weighing the complexity and the administrative cost of, of segregating everything, and there's annual report fees to the Secretary of State, and you're going to have to balance it. You know, who knows how many bank accounts if you have numerous entities. Uh, but if you're looking at it just for limiting liability, the more entities, the better. And so it's kind of a determining what's right for you. So, you know, Barry's got his, he's got his corporation set up, he's got his LLC, he's, he's taking care of the operations, and he's starting to think about how he's going to pass it on uh, when, when he decides to step back or when, when he passes away. And so he and his wife have two children, Luke and Leah. Uh, I'm a self-professed Star Wars fan. <laughs> like I'll say I like the old ones the best, but I, I, I religiously walk, watch all of them and go to the opening nights. Uh, so Leah, she works on the farm, but, but Luke, he, he goes off and does his own thing in the galaxy and says he's never going to work uh, on the farm. And so you know, Barry, he, he wants to treat his children equitably. Um, and, and that's generally what most parents will, will tell me is you know, they, the most common estate plan is to leave it equally to the kids. Uh, but, but in his situation, the farm is more than half of his assets, and so he's not really sure how he can achieve the goal of treating his children equally uh, while not putting Leia in the situation where he didn't want to be in with his siblings when, when Grandpa died way back at the beginning of this. So, so what are his options? Um, and, and there's really no one-size-fits-all that, that, that works for everybody. It's, it's really a personal preference. Um, one option is to see if he can buy life insurance that would then provide some other assets to equalize what, what Luke would receive and still be able to just give the farm entirely to Leia. Um, it, it, some, that works in a lot of situations. Uh, it doesn't work for everybody. There's, you have to be insurable. Um, so if you wait until you're later in life, uh, maybe you have some health issues. The cost of insurance, if you can get it, may just not be doable for a lot of people. Um, so it, it's, it's nice to say that that's a strategy, but sometimes it's just not practical. Um, a, a, another option for Barry would be able to s just accept that equitable doesn't mean equal. Um, there, you have, the law says you, you don't have to leave your kids anything. You can disinherit anybody. Uh, um, but except a surviving spouse, there's some rules that, that if you cut your wife out or your husband out completely, that they can elect against your will and get, get some assets from your estate. But as far as children, you can leave a child nothing. Uh, and so perhaps Barry could say, well, I'm going to give the farm to Leah and everything else to, to Luke, and I'll recognize that Leah's getting more, but she's stuck around. It's, it's, she put her sweat into the farm, and she, she's really earned it anyway. Um, so I've, I've found that it's rare that a parent would do that. Uh, for some reason, I, I'm not a father, so I don't know. Uh, but it, it seems like equal and equitable uh, are the same things in people's minds. So a third option that is a little more nuanced that, that people tend to like is first giving Luke all the non-farm assets. Then you give Leah the farm up to 50% of the value which ultimately means whatever the value of all the non-farm assets, she's going to have some number of over 50% of the value of the farm. Uh, and so she would have control. Uh, that would basically, Luke is a silent partner. He, he would benefit from some of the, the, the growth or the value, and he may even complain. Uh, she probably owes some fiduciary duties as a controlling shareholder to, to Luke, so she couldn't just pay herself everything so there's no profit to share to him. Uh, but often, if we're doing that structure, then I typically try to talk the Barry into giving Leia an option to buy out Luke. So basically, if she ever gets down the road, if she wants to go get a bank loan, uh, it, it maybe we'll let it, we'll build in some options where she can pay him over time. But to basically give her an option to be able to purchase it without having to negotiate with Luke. Uh, you, can, you can do all this in, there's, in estate planning documents or in your corporate documents. Uh, we can kind of build this plan in, and so hopefully you give Leia some control about what she's going to do, uh, what she wants to do, and how much risk she wants to take uh, without forcing them to get along. And, and 
the idea with a lot of estate planning is to try to make it so Luke and Leah can still be friends at the end of the day, uh, not putting them, kind of setting it up for them to argue. And so when we do kind of just other estate plan considerations as we go through this, you know, estate tax. Uh, I think we talked about right now it's, it's less than 1%, I think it's like 0.4% of the population now has to even worry about estate taxes because it's $11.5 million and it just keeps going up. So most of the time we don't have to do complex things in estate plans just because it's tax driven. But who knows what's, what's, what's going to happen uh, in the future. There's lots of talk, right now we're in the election times, and there's proposals being talked about having just an annual wealth tax. Uh, it was before my time that North Carolina used to have a, a, an intangibles tax, which was essentially a, a property tax on brokerage accounts. Um, so that people, our government is spending money and they're going to have to find revenue. To do it. And so taxes will, will probably always be around in, uh, as part of the plan. The other part of estate planning is incapacity planning. Uh, I, I think everybody needs a general power of attorney. Uh, th this is a document that says if you become incapacitated and you can't act for yourself, here is someone that can act for you in legal and financial matters. Um, and, and it's usually broad. It basically says they can do anything you can do for yourself. If you don't have that document and something happens to you and we have to go to court to have you declared incompetent, have to have a guardian appointed, it's just like in the beginning that a guardian for a minor. There is annual accounting. There's bonding. There's, uh, it's, it's, you gotta go to court, there's a hearing, it's costly, you can avoid all that by signing a simple document now, kind of putting it away. I, I revisit it from time to time to make sure you still trust the person you've named. Uh, but but that is a very simple way to avoid lots of costs. Your incapacity planning documents are all healthcare related. Um, usually it's not so costly to deal with those, but if you have in, in, you know, desires about who you wanna make healthcare decisions for you or things that, specific desires about end-of-life things, uh, those will help. A HIPAA authorization lets people get your private information. Usually it's the same people you've named in your powers of attorney. Uh, th those can all pay off dividends if you become incapacitated. Uh, I'll, I'll just add, when it, if it rains, I, 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 we, our office is downtown, I walk around a lot for lunch. If, if it's even cloudy, I carry my umbrella with me. It, maybe one out of 12 days it rains. I think of estate planning documents like that. Hopefully you put them in place and never need them, but the, the one day I go out without my umbrella, it rains. So uh, you don't have your estate planning documents, you may find yourself in some trouble. Uh, trust, when we've not really talked about any of this, but there are lots of things you can do with trust in your estate plans. Uh, minors, again, to avoid guardians for minors, you can set it up so they get it at a certain age and someone else is managing it outside of the court supervision. Um, you can, even if you have responsible children, you can leave their inheritance in trust and let them control it, and it'll be protected from their creditors. Uh, so again, if the farming operation, they have some creditor, if it's in a trust you created for them, their creditors shouldn't be able to get to it. Uh, that also applies in divorce. If you leave it to them in, in, a, in a trust and they get divorced, it should not be part of the equitable distribution proceeding in front of a family law judge. Uh, and then there's tax planning, both income tax and estate tax planning we can do with trust. Uh, probate avoidance. Probate is the process where the court supervises transfer of assets from you to whoever you've named in your will, or if you don't have a will, your intestate heirs. Uh, it's, it's set up, it's been around, it came over with us uh, from England when we were, became a country centuries ago. So it's, it's very, very uh, established now. Uh, we inventory your assets to the court, we pay your bills, we distribute your assets to your beneficiaries, and then we have to file an accounting with the court and show copies of every statement and you know, prove everything to the penny. It, it, it sounds generally simple, but it is, all those court filings are pretty costly, and usually the administration, if you're avoiding probate, is you know, one-tenth of the cost, at least our fees, if we can avoid probate than if we have to go through it. So you can do that. There's and then Medicaid planning. That's that's another one. So Medicaid, well, Medicare is the one thing that will all qualify for once you reach age 65. It's basically health insurance, hospital insurance. 
Medicaid is a means-tested program for assisted living, usually nursing home. Um, and basically they make you spin, spin down all of your assets before you'll qualify. And you, in North Carolina, it's, if you have $2,000 of accountable assets, if you're an individual, that's, you have to be down that low to be able to qualify. And, and countable assets doesn't include things like your home, and there's a few other things. But the idea is you, you go on it, the government pays for your nursing home care, then when you pass away, the government's gonna make a claim in your estate for whatever they've paid during your lifetime. And so usually that means they're going to you basically force the sale of the home, they're gonna keep whatever they paid, and if there's anything left over, it'll go to your beneficiaries. If, if, if you start, if it, if it looks like that's gonna be something you're gonna to have to deal with, there are things you can do on the front end to try to protect that value for your, your family. Uh, so those are just things to think about. And I think we've got- And, uh, and we are, we're out of time, I apologize. Uh, we will be around, we've got tables. Uh,